Well, let me, let me preface my remarks by making two points. First of all, it is true that I tweet. I recently, and I can barely use a telephone, I recently took it up and I was sitting beside Brian O'Driscoll at a dinner in London uh, to celebrate in advance the Irish victory in the World Cup. And <clears throat> he said to me, can I take a, a, a photograph and tweet it and send it to my dad? Because his dad played with me for UCD. And I said, um, sure. So we got together and the photograph was taken. And then he said to me, um, how many followers have you got? Now, I said, well, before I answer that question, I had started about three days before that. Not that it would make much difference, but in any event, I said, how many have you got? And he looked at me and he said, I couldn't believe it. I, I, he said, 630,000. I said, I beg, I don't believe it. So anyway, he showed me his telephone, but it was actually true. So he then said, how many of you got? And I said, I'm definitely not answering the question, so I didn't. Um, so any additional followers will be, will be welcomed. Um, any resemblance whatsoever between what I am going to say and the text, which may or may not be distributed, but is available, is purely a coincidence, because I've decided I'm not going to deliver the text. I'm going to speak to you um, and hopefully engage you in dialogue on a very important issue. First of all, if I may be terribly egotistical, let me explain what I'm doing and how I came to be doing it. When I was in uh, the World Trade Organization, which to me was the biggest thing in my previous career, uh, I knew Kofi Annan rather well. And he telephoned me about 10 years ago when he was direct, when he was Secretary General at the UN and asked me whether I would be prepared to become involved in the area of human mobility. He actually wanted me to consider joining <coughs> UNHCR. And I said, I'd be very interested. And he said, I said, when? And he said, in a fortnight. And I said, I'm chairman of BP, I can't walk out in two weeks. <laughs> so it fell by the wayside. Subsequently, he came back to me and said, will you become my special representative? And I've done that for a number of years <clears throat> and became involved in trying to fa find a way through this issue of national sovereignty, which for some countries is a fundamental blockage between their engagement in multilateral activities and the issue of migration. That was particularly true of uh, the United States. And John Bolton, who was the uh, ambassador of the United States at that time to the UN, uh, told me in no uncertain terms after my appointment that if I had any intent of bringing migration as a subject into the UN, that he personally and the President of the United States would block it. He more or less threw me out of his office. Although that would have been a difficult job because I was very, about four stone heavier than I am today. But in any event, uh, <coughs> I then had to find a way of bringing migration into UN debate without losing the OECD countries, most of whom were terribly worried about being exposed to criticism on human rights, on the openness of their uh, borders, etc. And we conceived at that time of the Global Forum of Migration and Development, which I'm traveling to, as it happens, this Sunday in Turkey. And that was <coughs> by the dilution of the topic into one which encompassed development as well as migration, it allowed for a dialogue that wasn't offensive to the sovereignty oriented states, and yet at the same time gave voice to issues. Because the international apparatus dealing with the issues of migration is bifurcated in terms of the two lead institutions between UNHCR, which deals with refugees, and IOM, which isn't in 
the United Nations, which deals with migrants more generally. And that's a subject I'll be coming back to, the issue of economic migrants. So this <coughs> gradually developed, and the, UN, the uh, uh, Global Forum is now quite an interesting five-day event with ma massive participation both by states particularly, but also by NGOs and others. And as I said, it's taking place next week. And <clears throat> at the same time, a number of us gradually became engaged together in looking at the future strategies in regard to migration before the chaotic situation, which I'll come back to in a second, of Syria, Eritrea, and Afghanistan in particular, but others have, that have been mentioned as well, came on the table in the way that it has. And we formed a quartet. The High uh, Commissioner for Refugees, High Commissioner for um, <coughs> Human Rights, uh, myself, and the head of IOM, Bill Swing. And we've been issuing statements, which some of you may have seen, which have been considered according to what the Secretary General seems to have said at the General Assembly last week, inflammatory, but um, he didn't use the word inflammatory, but he implied it, in particular in regard, I should say, to me, but I don't think in an entirely negative way. Because we have witnessed, collectively and individually, the failure of international organizations and institutions in dealing with the problem of migration in the context of Syria in particular. And we all know the figures, the 560,000 who have crossed the Mediterranean to date this year, the number of deaths, 3,000 at least this year, but that's a cumulative figure. And we've seen demonstrations of the failure of the institutional response. And that failure has been at a regional level, a national level, and an international level. And <coughs> when you look at what is happening and you see the results of that failure, particularly on the ground, you recognize that this is indeed the crisis that was referred to in the introductory statements uh, to this speech. Two weeks ago, I went to Calais privately on my own. I was walking around Calais <coughs> when there was a tear gas attack and there was a confrontation with the security forces. I saw one of the most appalling, scandalous places that I'd ever seen in terms of a camp where people, according to the doctors whom I met there, some of whom were in the early stages of TB, others scabies, in the most insanitary and appalling circumstances. I've been to camps in many places. I'm going to be going to camps on Sunday and Monday in Turkey. I've seen also in those camps an enormously positive private public reaction to what is happening, including, funnily enough, in, in Calais, by Irish individuals. Many NGOs are individuals. Huge numbers of people arriving to the camp and actually distributing clothes or food or whatever. <coughs> but you can't, as an institutionalist, and I was there at the formation of the WTO, so I know a little bit about it. You can't look at this without saying there must be a better way than the ad hocism of individuals and NGOs trying to help in an appalling situation. There must be something more fundamental by way of institutional international response. We've watched then, <coughs> with some dismay, the European Union in its manoeuvring around this problem. <coughs> My view, and some of you <coughs> academics may have a more sophisticated analysis than mine, in my view the Commission's papers have been excellent. In my view also, the leadership of Mrs. Merkel has been close to noble. And the leadership of a couple of countries, Sweden in particular, has been excellent. 
but others appalling. If you look at some of the statements from Central and Eastern Europe, which were attacked rightly by Mrs. Merkel a couple of days ago in Strasbourg, where she said, in effect, how can you have a belief in fundamental morality if you say that you will only accept migrants if they're Christians? How can that possibly be part and parcel of a world in which we live? that subscribes to the equality of man and the dignity of man as the fundamental principles underlying the UN itself and the European Union also. How can we have a situation which has been allowed to develop where we have 1.7 million refugees from Syria in Turkey, we have one quarter of the population of Lebanon as Syrian refugees, and it's comparable number <coughs> in Jordan. And how can we live in a world where within the European Union virtually all of the Mediterranean migrants who cross the sea, many of whom are drowned, go to Greece primarily and Italy second. And I've been to the camps in Italy where, again, public reaction is very gratifying in terms of their engagement with trying to help people. But how can we, as Europeans, <coughs> in regard to the resettlement proposals, uh, in ter terms of the relocation programs and ideas of the Commission, and you know the difference, uh, all of you, I'm sure, of between the two, if you're talking about resettlement, you're talking about the huge numbers who are to be found in the countries that I've mentioned outside the EU. If you're talking about <coughs> relocation, you're talking about those who are within, in particular, uh, uh, Greece and Italy, <coughs> but others as well. How can, you, how, how can you possibly say that proximity defines responsibility? It's clear if you read the preamble of the 1951 Convention that the intention is that this is a global responsibility. But within the European Union, if the meaning of the word solidarity has any effect on our thinking processes politically, then you should have a situation where we agree to share the burden between those countries who are carrying it. And we've had a pathetic response from some countries, one of which was generously taken on the shoulder of the Dean, the United Kingdom. The other, others primarily being Central and Eastern European. <coughs> How can you have a situation where Germany says, we will take 800,000 this year, and next year we will take 500,000, and the following four, four years we will take 500,000 a year. How can you have countries like Sweden, which is the largest per capita, you have a largest per capita number of refugees taken in, left carrying a burden that others will not share? How can you have a situation where Funnily enough, Denmark, which in many respects is not behaving well, advertising in countries from which refugees come in full-page advertisements saying, don't come to Denmark, but is, it is in fact the second highest per capita uh, uh, country in terms of the acceptance of refugees. So <clears throat> the refugee problem, at least in theory, is the easiest to address. It's the easiest to address because it is a moral imperative that people who are persecuted should be supported. I don't know how anyone can argue against it. And they can't legally do it in terms of the obligations which are undertaken through the Convention. Where it becomes more difficult, and this debate, I think, is only beginning, is in the definition 
and responsibilities to economic migrants, whatever they are. Economic migrants are apparently everyone else. And we've had statements from Mr. Cameron. Economic migrants, he says, we send them all back. We've heard then, somewhat to my surprise, broadly comparable remarks from Chancellor Merkel and, and Monsieur Hollande. <coughs> so, wilting under the pressure of public opinion and political activity in countries around Europe, people are, they want an answer to the problem. Is, is there no end to our responsibility? And they answered by saying, yes, there is an end to our responsibility, and the end to our responsibility is refugees. We accept our responsibility to refugees, even if we don't live up to those responsibilities. And <clears throat> this is extremely dangerous. The discussion which took place yesterday in the Council of Ministers was the beginnings of a discussion about I say this in pejorative terms, the great airlift of <coughs> migrants who are economic migrants home. They're going to be sent home. Who are they? What is the difference between an economic migrant which, who is facing death in their own country as opposed to persecution, which would entitle them to be protected as refugees, what is the obligation to them? I actually think the role that I have, because there's nobody else, although I'm operating literally alone, while with a couple of helpers, is to try to defend them. All that our politicians seem, well, this is an exaggeration, but the main focus of their ac activities seems to be enforcement, sending battleships to the Mediterranean. Battleships, I don't know how they are more successful in rescuing unfortunate migrants than inflatables, but battleships collecting people, taking them on board, and then dumping them in Italy, because that's where they all go, including from our ships, Germans, British, everyone, the Italians. What did the Italians do? They tried to cope, no doubt, but in reality, most of those who arrive are looking rapidly to the Alps. And then when <coughs> That becomes difficult when the activities in enforcement, which are now being reinforced by resolutions of the Security Council and so on, and smugglers who are, in the main, behaving exceptionally and awfully badly, and traffickers who are, of course, qualitatively much worse, are to be arrested. Is this to be the reaction? This is what we do. We forget about the people and we arrest people on boats. So what do they have? We've had nine months and we've had 16 arrests. 16, one six arrests with six warships and seven helicopters. And we're told we have to reinforce border security. And Frontex and the defense of borders becomes the common theme for political presentation because it's felt to be, at home, an acceptable message in a situation where concern about the migrants, about the individuals, the people-centric approach is ignored. And even if there was any moral base for that situation, it is utterly futile. Anybody who knows anything about this 
knows that the smugglers become more sophisticated. They avoid the navies, combined navies of Europe, no matter how many ships they put down there. They get across the Mediterranean by hook or by crook, whether it's into Turkey or somewhere else. The people keep coming, and the numbers, 560,000, as I said, so far this year, keep growing. And with them, the number of deaths keep growing. And while lives are saved, and it's very commendable that our ships and other ships, our ship and other ships are saving lives, but it doesn't solve the problem. Now, you might well say, as somebody said to me at another speaking engagement yesterday, well, what's your solution? <coughs> There is no simple solution. There is no magic wand. But there are a number of principles. The first principle is that our fundamental obligation is to save and protect lives. The second principle has to be humanitarian concern. One has to accept that there isn't and couldn't be a viable open door policy where anybody and everybody, no matter how deprived, can come into Europe. I accept that. I'm somewhat reluctant about it, but I accept it. But we have to have a better way than the way we have at the moment. We have to look at assessing whether somebody is a refugee in North Africa, if we can do it. At least you can save lives, because after you assess them to be refugees, you can undertake obligations in regard. You could, if you wish to, undertake obligations to have them. You can do more in terms of harmonizing the whole assessment of refugee status. At the moment, 0.2% or something are successful in Hungary in assessments of being, being uh, refugees, whereas it's 44%, I think, in, in Germany. How can we have this? And now we have this new grand design of sending home economic migrants, which up to a point is an inevitability, <coughs> I concede. But <clears throat> how can you have that when you have totally different assessment obligations in different countries. Isn't it, is it not open, I hope it isn't, but is it not open for some countries to stack the deck in terms of the assessment of whether a person is a, is a, a refugee or not in favor of the conclusion that they are not refugees and therefore can't be sent home? Or have we an assurance of objectivity? The evidence would seem to suggest that there is either a lack of obje objectivity or, a, alternatively, huge differences in interpretation of what we're talking about. So, <coughs> on the other hand, the paper, and I just read it on my telephone this morning, that was produced uh, on the <coughs> for the council does contain good things. We have to have <coughs> more legal migration as part of any ultimate amelioration of the position. We have to have um, a rule-based system which is not really proposed in the area which I've talked about in regard to return of people in my view, we have to have humanitarian visas which cover situations where the person is not a refugee but is a person who is facing the issue of survival, for lack of a better word. We have to have a new structural base. Our institutional fabric has to be changed. At the moment, we have UNHCR and IOM, in particular, a chef de file, if you like. <coughs> one inside the UN, one outside it. 
doing similar things, unfortunately, harmoniously because of two excellent leaders, Guterres and Swing. I'm not suggesting and I don't believe that they should be merged because it's vital that we retain the separate existence and recognize the accepted, exceptional refugee status. And if we open that up for debate as to whether it should be different from that which it is, namely persecution, we're opening a Pandora's box which quite a number of European states would go through not to extend and amplify those who we would save, but to restrict. So <clears throat> we have a whole range of things, in particular dialogue with Africa, which on the 11th of November, and I'll be there in Valletta, will take place in regard to the discussion of dialogue between countries of origin, transit, and destination. The difficulty is that some of those countries of transit have no effective government. Libya, a main taking off spot. It's difficult to talk when you've two groups both claiming to be government and neither governing. So we have a very difficult and dangerous situation. We have a, a war in Syria changed radically in the last days by the Russian engagement. According to the Turkish government, the bombing and missile attacks on Aleppo and the Aleppo area could lead to three million more migrants. I don't know whether that's accurate or not, but you can't but believe that the extension of war brings the extension of, uh, of uh, those who are <coughs> in need <coughs> of, who feel that they must depart. In this whole context of this new idea, at least the reinvigoration of the return, the economic migrants initiative, are we going to be faced within a short time, as some suggest, perhaps by proposals that certain countries formerly considered to be persecuting countries are no longer to be considered persecuting countries. I'm not going to say it because even by the rather flexible interpretation of my own mandate that I apply, that would go too far for me to say it. But there is one country that is sometimes mentioned in this context where I have no doubt whatsoever that it is a persecution country. But if the attempt is to restrict the number of refugees and therefore to say that whole category of people crossing the Mediterranean by definition are not refugees. Now if that's the intention, which I hope sincerely it isn't, it's another gaping potential hole in the moral fabric of what we're trying to do. I think the UN has to play a key role in this. On that issue that I mentioned earlier of proximity does not define responsibility. I think that we have to have, before too long, a global commitment by countries around the world to take refugees. That happened at the time of Hungary. <coughs> it happened at the time of the Vietnam boat people. And some countries are stepping up to the plate, including the United States, Brazil, and Venezuela, I believe, are agreeing to take uh, some. But that has to become a more general commitment including from countries that have a currently negative attitude towards the whole migration debate. So the task is monumental. But the fundamental issue 
for those of us who live in Europe must be that the European Union has to get its act together. And the sort of headlines that you see in some tabloids in the large island beside us saying that the migration problem is an EU problem is an absolutely cruel distortion of the facts. It's a member state problem. The EU institutions have said what should be done. They've proposed it, including the sharing mechanism. They have tried and they've been rebuffed. And those who think that blaming Europe for the failure of European migration policy may be politically helpful are going to reap the whirlwind in terms of the response because the conflation of the issue of migration, for an example, with Brexit, is going to work <coughs> against the government, a government, which might wish to stay in Europe. And that, I think, is already becoming evident in polls. But that is another debate. And <clears throat> I've already, as is my way, gone far further in terms of time and indeed of content than I either could, should, or would have intended to go. But <clears throat> it gives you an idea of the issues that have to be addressed and on which us pedestrian, practical, practical people need academic support. And we're getting it from some people in, I know in, in this audience. Because we have to find a way through this, institutionally and so on. But don't expect miracles. Because governments, far from moving to embrace the resolution of this problem, are, as far as I can see, generally intimidated by the xenophobic and racist voices in their own societies, capitulating to something which many of us hoped that Europe had left long behind us. And that's why people like Mrs. Merkel, who I think express noble sentiments in Strasbourg, deserve support. And it's why Sweden deserves support. We in this little country haven't been terrible. I'm not going to say that we have. And we haven't created, as far as I know, a political movement of the kind which is evidenced by UKIP Le Pen and so on in the continent. And the voice generally of Ireland has been constructive. This is good. But there's a lot more to do. And it requires courage. It's very easy for me to be sanctimonious about the issue of migrants and uh, refugees. I concede that it's much more difficult for politicians who have an electorate who are being induced by a form of nationalism, perhaps all nationalism, is racist in its essence. George Orwell once said that a nationalist is a person who believes that he's better than the next person. I think he's basically right, but every time I tweeted that once and I was nearly deluged with attacks uh, from familiar sources. But <coughs> <coughs> somebody, al <coughs> sorry, somebody also said about nationalism that it involves people who cannot reconcile their vision of the past with the future that they have to embrace and cannot avoid. And they cannot avoid this future, a future of a more multicultural society, of people from different races mixing and living together,
go into any bar, restaurant, or cafe in this city of ours, and the odds are that you will be served by somebody who comes from another country. This university, thank God, is becoming a multinational university, as it should be. So this is a time of immense challenge for our values and our commitment. And this is a subject worth fighting for. I don't mean literally, but worth fighting for in terms of standing up and being counted on the issue itself. Thank you very much.